Well, on behalf of our pastoral staff and everyone here this morning, we want to welcome all of you, you know, to Mosaic. So um, I tell you, I get excited when I come up to the front every time I pray, every time I worship, every time I speak, because I like to, I, I share with you the, the reality you know, that the psalmist looks forward to. Every time I read that verse, it says, you know, I looked up onto the hills, he says. From where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. And then he says, the, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth. You know, it just gets, you can't but help but be moved when you, when you read those expressions. I've been reading through the psalms, part of my devotional time. And I tell you, I just get excited. Even when you get to the end, he just continues. He says, you know, praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament. Uh, the Lord is good, yes? yes? You know, before we jump into our message this morning, you know, I, I want to solicit your prayers. I, um, I've been preoccupied over the past couple of weeks. My, uh, my brother, who I uh, care about very deeply, I carry him upon my heart uh, for many reasons, but, um, but for this one particular reason, his wife um, has been diagnosed with cancer uh, since last year, and she's present. I just got a text uh, while we were uh, bringing in Daniel into our membership, and that said that, he, um, that she's in ICU. Uh, so um, we want to pray for them. Um, my brother's name is Tito, and her name is you know, Eva. And so let's keep them in prayer. Um, just remember them. So we're going to jump into our message this morning. We've been on this theme on unity. And we've, been, we've seen a variety of different uh, themes on this, uh, on unity. And we are going to be talking this morning about committed unity. Committed unity in the body. Committed unity in the body. In fact, um, I know last week we hadn't had time to continue um, in that, along that vein because we had our youth Sabbath. And so I'm going to go ahead and by way of review, we're going to go ahead and do a quick review and then we'll jump into uh, the theme. Uh, so before we do that, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, I am so grateful that we are part of a church family here in Fairview that prays for one another, that lifts each other up. We just brought our prayer cards. We just brought our burdens, Father, and we deposited them, so to speak, symbolically on a piece of paper into this basket. I know, Lord, because I carry those burdens too, and I'm sure that many of us this morning have come with heavy hearts, yet many don't show them, Father, because, they, uh, because of the love of Christ in their hearts, they still smile. But for many of us, we are broken, and we come this morning because we are looking for healing. We are looking for Jesus to do something incredible in our hearts and in our minds. Throughout this week, Father, we have just been assaulted by the enemy. And I know, Lord, because my family has been. And this morning, I just want to take a moment before we jump into this theme to lift up Eva right now. Lord, you know that she has taken a turn, um, and we're looking to ask that you be with the, with the medical staff, with the doctors, the technicians, the nurses, everyone that's, that, that supports uh, the healing process, Father. Be with her, Lord. This journey has been long and quite painful. And so, Father, hold her and sustain her. That she may not feel, Father, the pain and the suffering that was never your intent for any of us to experience. But yet, Lord, we're here because of that. And we look this morning to you, the healer, the sustainer, the one that we can look up on the hill and we can draw strength and comfort from the one who created the worlds. The one who we worship this morning, like the psalmist says, worship him in the sanctuary. Worship him and praise him with your songs. Oh, Lord, that's why we're here. May you continue, Father, to be in our presence. Father, how can we be committed in unity to the body? 
Lord, we've been talking about this unity. And so here we are. Oh, Father, are we, can we be united in this vein? Of course. And so, Father, in these moments that we have together, may you bring that sense of unity, Lord, as we read through Scripture. And more importantly, may your Holy Spirit bind us to one another as we lift you up, Father, at this time through your word. And more importantly, Father, through the actions in which we represent you. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, quick review, and then we're going to jump into committed unity. The committed part we're going to jump into in just a moment. But, you know, we've been, just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the factor of two. I refer to it as the power of two. I'm not sure if you remember, but that power of two is, we, we looked at it as a God-given, creative um, thing that we discovered in Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to go there in just a moment. In fact, if you want to start making your way there, you can, because that's where we're going to pick up again. In Matthew chapter 18 of that gospel, it's the first gospel in the New Testament. And what's interesting about th- this, um, <clears throat> this, this, this teaching that we first started was this factor of two, the power of two, that it takes one person, just one person to become your ally. If there is one person who is your ally and he agrees with you, you will invariably find courage to take a stand for what you believe in. Whatever it is, if you believe in truth, In the scriptures, if you believe in something to be so, that that person who agrees with you will give you enough courage in a group of people who may be gainsaying or may be disagreeing with you because you know how it goes. If you have a group of people and you're the only one that is that believes a particular way, you may not necessarily stand up and form your opinion. But if you find someone to agree with you, that's the power of two. If you find someone that agrees with you in that context, invariably that will give you courage. You will find that courage within you to take a stand for what you believe in. In fact, that's what Jesus brings out in that gospel when we looked at that power of two. It just seems to emerge because, see, Jesus is talking here about unity indirectly as he speaks to the issue of conflict management. See, during Jesus' ministry, Jesus is teaching about conflict management, and he's talking about unity and how to preserve it. And of course, in the middle of this teaching, you see this emerge. In fact, let me quickly take you there, because in verse 15 of chapter 18, Jesus is saying, and this feature is in most Bibles, if it's read, you know it's coming out of Jesus' mouth, off his lips, he says, if your sister, if your brother go sins, go and show his fault in private just between the two. See, there it is, the power of two, just between the two of you. And we, and we discover that Jesus is actually trying to do something. Why does he say, keep this between the two of you? Why does he want this to be exclusive just between the two of you? That's because he is trying to emphasize something. He is trying to point out that God is in, that God values the dignity of the individual. He's looking at preserving the self-respect of the individuals that are in that circle. You know how it is when you start talking about things to others, you tend to make a, a mountain out of a small little molehill. And so Jesus is trying to preserve just the two, the power of two. And so here, he begins talking about that, the two, go to the two. But if the person, of course, doesn't listen, then he says you take others. But if done in the right attitude, it should work. But if it doesn't, he says, then you take others with you. And if they don't listen, he ultimately says there in chapter 7, in verse 17, I should say, he ultimately says, let him or her be to you as a Gentile, different translations render that as a pagan and a tax collector. And we notice, do we leave them there? No, 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 no. We do not leave them in that condition. 
In other words, what Jesus is talking about, we saw that that is the opportunity not to treat them as a pagan or a tax collector, but to treat them how? As a lost sheep. You remember that? We've come, they now have become the product of the very mission of the church to redeem them to the love of Christ. And we, we, we're doing that to reconnect, to reconnect with the lost sheep. But it's not just, and I, and I brought this out a couple of weeks ago, is it just the lost sheep of the ones that somehow disconnect with us? What about the lost sheep of our own church family? And that's a good thing to reconnect with the lost sheep of our church family. But, <clears throat> and I asked the question, but what are we doing to love the heart of that one back to Jesus? What are we doing? And see, and what's so fascinating about where we left off is that that power of two now emerges to be the power of two, the power of Christ and his church. The power of Christ in his church, the group, the body, the church family is what I'm referring to. And that's what's so fascinating about this because in the context of this, in the context of Jesus' directive on conflict management and trying to preserve the unity through this power of two, tucked away in these verses here, it's just a stunning picture of the Mosaic Christian Fellowship Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know that? You didn't know that. Well, do you want to see it? All right. Well, I was planning on showing it to you anyway. So I'm going to take you there because um, this is the reason why we've entitled this, you know, committed unity in the body. You know, the, the power of Christ and his church. Let's take a look at this because there is, by the way, no other gospel in the New Testament. This is the only gospel. The Gospel of Matthew is the only gospel, unlike Mark, unlike Luke, unlike John, Matthew actually takes a moment to carve in this portrait of the church, the body of Christ. And how does he do it? He does it by simply inserting the, the, those, that word church, whereas you won't find it in any of the gospels. Take a look at this with me because we're going to pick up um, right here in verse 17. Chapter 18 verse 17. Only mention, here it is. He says, if he or she refuses to what? To listen to the person, take it to the what, everyone? Take it to the church, right? I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, but most versions render that word the same. It's the Greek word, ekklesia, the one ekklesia called out, the ones that formed the church. So he says, if they refuse to listen, tell them to the congregation, the church family. And if he or she still refuses to listen, even to the what, everyone? Even to the church. So Matthew now introduces, in just in one verse, two powerful words, church, to give us the impression that church is very large. It's big in his teaching of the theology of the church, the teaching of the church. In fact, these are just two of the words. Two times he mentions the word church. But notice, we're going to go somewhere. Okay, put a bookmarker in your Bible. And if you don't have a, a Bible with you, that's fine. We're going to put up this, the, the next verse up on the screen. But put it in your Bible if you want to go there. It's in Matthew chapter 16, just a chapter right before, a couple of chapters before the one we just read. And notice what Jesus is telling the disciple Peter with regards to this idea of how he values and how he sees the church. Jesus says, I tell you that you are Peter, he says, and that on this rock, on this rock, he's using Peter as this metaphor for the church. On this rock, I will build my what, everyone? Church, the third time he uses it. Matthew is big on the body of Christ. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, he says, will not overcome it. And so Matthew is using three times. In chapter 16, once. Chapter 18, twice. This idea that Jesus is very big on church. He loves the church. I love the church. He died for the church. I would too, given the right circumstances, right? How, and, and if you think about it, how, how high 
If you had to quantify how much does he actually love the church? Well, let's, let's invert this a moment. Let's apply it to ourselves. How much do you love the church? Because we're talking about what this morning? We're talking about united commitment. Commitment to unite in terms of the body. Committed unity in the body. We're talking about that. How important is it? Well, notice this. We're in chapter 18. Drop down the next verse. And look how important is it? How high is it? Well, let's find out. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whoever... Whatever, whomever, many translations, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Notice, do you catch what's happening here? I know many of you are probably thinking, what is Jesus talking about? What does he mean? This binding and then loosing and then loosing and binding. What is he talking about? Did you catch the, 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 the importance of what Jesus is trying to emphasize? Because he's describing here in just one line an outstanding solidarity between the body, the church, and something that's happening in heaven. Yeah, it's a solidarity between the church down here and heaven up there. And what's interesting about this, depending on which translation you're reading from, in fact, if you read it in, in, the, in the Greek, in the original language, it actually can be rendered either way. In other words, it can be either the church is taking the action and heaven is just ratifying it or the other way around. Heaven initiates the action and then earth ratifies it. So it all depends how you want to read it. But the bottom line is simply this. Whichever, who, which, whoever takes the action first, the other follows. That's it. it. It doesn't matter who goes first. Sometimes a lot of people think that, oh, whoa, 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 wait a second. No, no, it does matter. The, the order of the primacy. No, 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 no. It doesn't. Whoever acts f- first, the other follows. It's this notion of servant leadership. It doesn't matter who goes first, the other follows. There's solidarity. That's the point. The point is the solidarity between heaven and earth and what happens on earth and in heaven. And the point I believe that Jesus is making is inescapable. The church is a big deal. I mean, I don't know. Think about it. It has to be. Because when you begin looking even beyond the scope of Scripture... Many people, I read this book, I want to share with you quickly. Look, notice the statement here out of the book entitled, I Believe in the Church. In this book, the author, he makes a, a fascinating premise. Let's take a look at it. It says, the existence of the Christian community of the church in its ideal form, he's talking about the ideal here, is what? The fullest representation of God that the world can at this moment see that's it it's the church i mean look at it it's the fullest how does he say it revelation representation it's the fullest revelation that's it that's that word we get for the last book of the old testament to reveals when 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 john the revelator he's like pulling aside the curtain he's revealing something he says it's the fullest revelation of god oh in fact, he's not alone. Many years before this author actually put into paper and put it to press, this woman here in her book entitled Acts of the Apostle, Ellen White says this. And let's go ahead and put that up. She says, enfeeble and defective as it may appear, not that it is, it may appear that way, the church is the one object upon which God bestows a what? In a special sense, his supreme regard. Isn't that beautiful? You see what she's saying? Bestows the supreme regard. I mean, think about this for a second. Is there anything larger, is there anything higher than supreme? Who said that? That's good. Take credit for that because you're right. There's nothing above the pecking order. It's like a glass ceiling. There's nothing above the supreme. In fact, just recently, you know, you look at a lot of the decisions that have been rendered by the United States Supreme Court, which when the courts 
make a verdict and hand down their decision, that legal decision tends to trickle down to all the states. And all the states have to what? They have to ratify it. But now, you know, recently, I'm not sure that's going to happen with some of these uh, decisions that they have been sending down. But notice that it's the supreme decision. It's the highest of the highest. And it happens to agree, <clears throat> I happen to agree with both of them, with both writers. Because the point that Jesus is making in the New Testament is that the church is high in his list. In fact, when you look at the entire New Testament, the entire New Testament that builds on, on, on the Messiah's foundational teaching of the church in the Gospel of Matthew, is, he is not exclusive in this teaching. You find it replete throughout the entire New Testament. In fact, I want to quickly take you through four symbols, four metaphors that will kind of quickly give us in a broad stroke how God views this body in its complete wholeness. Let's take a look at that real quick. Okay, the first one, the first metaphor, in different verses, you guys can look those up at another time if you want. Um, for in the interest of time, we're going to kind of quickly fly through this. But the first one, the first metaphor there in those verses, Paul, many times, John, in the book of Revelation, describes the body of Christ. How? Bet in a relationship between husband and wife. He says, he says, I am prepared to make that bride for her bridegroom. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Let's take a look at the next one. The body of Christ, where Christ is where? At the head. That relationship, at the head. Okay, let's take a look at the third one. The building, the building, where Christ, who's at the center of the structure, so to speak, he's, he is using the, the architectural device in Scripture to put himself to be the cornerstone. And the last one, the last one, having Christ as the captain of your life. Many of you, if you go to Ephesians, where Paul, in the last chapter of, of that book to the Ephesians, he describes a whole complement of, of battle armor. He says, put on the whole armor of Christ that you may, what, stand in the time of trial. And there, when you look at all the, the accompaniment, the paraphernalia, the spiritual paraphernalia, you are part of that battalion that Christ uses in his arsenal against the enemy. You become the representatives. So the battalion of Christ with him as captain. These are interesting metaphors, but they're more than interesting. They're before us this morning because there are some and I encountered them many times as you go about in ministry. I'm sure many of you probably have come across them as well. There are many people that often say, you know, I accept these metaphors. I recognize the body as the, you know, the church, the church family, the body of Christ. You know, I, I can understand that, but, you know, I really just accept Jesus. I just accept Jesus. Have you ever heard that expression? No? I accept Jesus, but I don't accept her church. So on one side, you get people that say, yes, everything, everything. Praise God, I accept Jesus. But on this other side over here, you know, no, 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 I, I don't accept the church. No, no, no. Don't ask me about the church. Have you ever had that, exp you ever had that experience? Now, does that make sense to you? I mean, every time I come across individuals that say, yes, I accept Jesus, but I don't accept the church. No way, Jose. In my mind, I'm thinking, are you serious? Really? I mean, come on, does that make sense, yes or no? Come on. I, it doesn't make sense at all. I mean, think about it this way. You know, we're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about the bride of Christ. You know, in terms of relationships with people who are dating or are courting one person versus the other, can, can you turn around and say, you know, girl, you know, you know I, I, I love your head, but I can't stand your body. Yeah. Guys, does that make sense, guys? Really? Can, can, ha, ha, <laughs> you know, I, I'll tell you, that, I, I, you know, can you love the head of a woman but not her body? Because, you know, it's usually the other way around, you know. When you talk with guys, it's like they flip the order. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the sooner you figure this out, the better it will be for you in your dating rituals. It would. You know, you cannot 
Love the head and forget about the body. You just can't love the head and ignore the body. It's one package. It's holistic. It's one and whole. You know, I accept the head, but I have no time for the body. It just doesn't resonate in your mind. You have, many people say, you know what? I have time for the head. I do, I have time for the head, but I don't have time for the body, baloney. If you have no time for the body, you don't have time for the head. In fact, you, it, it, it's just, you're playing a simple game. That's really what it is. It's just a simple game in which we're talking about one and not the other, but it's actually, when it all comes down to it, I really describe it, you're just fooling yourself. That's how I describe it. You're just fooling yourself. And this is partly the reason why we're calling it committed in unity to the body. Because you can't love one and not the other. You have to love both. In fact, <clears throat> let me ask you this. Why the body, the church family? Why be committed to it? If somebody was to ask you, why are you committed to the church? And if you're on this side where you're Jesus alone, you're thinking, well, I'm not committed. But if you're over here on this side, just the church, you're thinking, am I really committed? Hmm. So if somebody was to ask you, how would you define commitment? How would you define I'm committed or just the word committed? Well, let me, let me share with you Miriam Webster's dictionary decision, uh, rendition of that, of, um, of that definition. Miriam Webster defines it this way. It's a dedication. Dedication and loyalty to a what? It's a cause. A cause, an activity, a job. But I like the last, that last definition. A wholehearted, a wholeheartedly dedicated person. Are you wholehearted? Am I? Are we? I want to let that sink in. Let, let that definition hang on that screen for a moment longer. Because I want you to let that sink in while I try to put that in a practical illustration. I want you to imagine as you're thinking about that wholehearted dedication, what does it mean to be completely dedicated to the body in this context? There was a, <clears throat> a church that was enthusiastic about its mission in trying to reach the homeless in the city in which that church was located. So they went to a local farmer on the outskirts of that city and they told them about their ministry initiative about wanting to, to feed the homeless in that city. And so the livestock were listening to that conversation. There was a pig and a hen in the same barnyard that overheard that discussion about the church's program to feed the hungry. You know, and the pig went over to the hen and said, hey, does that get you excited? And the hen said, absolutely. I'm excited about that. And the pig and the hen, they started talking. And so the hen told the chicken, you know, how can we contribute to this? And then they started, dial they started you know, brooding over the idea. And the hen said, I got it. I got it. I know what we can do. We can have a ham. We can have a bacon and egg breakfast for them. We can feed all of them. Feed all of them with bacon and, and, and eggs. They love that bacon and eggs. Breakfast. And, 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 you know, and the hen is just, she's just all excited. And, and, the, and, and, and the pig is looking at her very, he was smiling, but then all of a sudden, he was not smiling anymore. He was serious. And he took that moment and he replied, wait a second. You mean to tell me? Yes, yes, yes. What do you think? And his reply was, well, for you, that's a mere contribution, but for me, it requires a total commitment. <laughs> a committed dedication. Right, yeah. Let me tell you, the reality is you cannot, you cannot, you cannot be close to the head without being close to the body. It's a package. In fact, it's not just in the, old, in the New Testament, it's in the New Testament. Let's take a look at that. Let's go there. Zechariah. This is just before the book of Malachi, before he enters into the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. The prophet Zechariah says, This is what the Lord, the Almighty, says. Whoever touches you, Zion, Zion, the body of Christ, he touches the what? What does he touch? 
You become, so to speak, the apple of his eye. The church is the apple of his eye. The church is the bride of Christ. It is the bride of his heart. Do you know any bridegroom who doesn't get excited the moment he stands at the altar and he sees his beautiful bride coming all decked out in white or in beige or whatever color she wants to come down with because the color doesn't matter. She's gorgeous. And he wants to receive her. And he looks at her and it just lights him up like a Christmas tree. You become the apple of his eye. The church is the bride of his head. I mean, think about it. And, and the reality as we look at all of this is that you cannot be close to Christ and far from his church. You can't. So the people that say, I follow Christ, you know, and they stand over here. They say, I'm a follower of Christ, but I can't stand the church. Ah, I'm going to tell you something. Don't get upset at me. All right? If you have someone who says, yes, I'm a follower of Christ. I believe in Jesus, but I don't accept the church. You don't know Jesus. You don't know Jesus. You know, don't get upset with me because you can't separate the two. You can't, you can't remove Jesus from the body. They're one and the same. They're one and the same. When Jesus brings and, and embraces his bride, they're one and the same. It's a commitment. It's the same commitment, very similar to when you stand and you interchange your vows of love and commitment and solidarity. You love one another. And it hurts. It hurts when you try to tear them apart. Wow. It hurts. And I know, I know it all too well because the moment that you stand... You know, as an ambassador, you stand as a disciple, you stand as a representative. Those that want to take the side of Jesus, you stand and you say, how can that be? It hurts, yes, because you can't. You can't separate. And I'll tell you, you don't need to, to go back to the 1400s, to the 1500s, to look at the time during the Middle Ages when the church did some atrocious things. I mean, you look at the church through the eyes of prophetic history, and they did some horrible things, terrible things, you know, um, unimaginable things. Talking about the crusades, the persecutions, and on and on and on. They've made some really big mistakes, but you know what? You don't have to go down that far, because even in the 21st century, our churches have made big mistakes. And I know because I'm in it. Yes, and you're in it. And so we're here. We're part of it. And there's no excuse. I could tell you, you can look at the body of Christ, and I can tell you that there is absolutely shoddy administration, unethical ones. And in some cases, if, 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 the, if you're looking at the news who tends to inform us that even you know, immoral behavior on part of those congregations that lead the church, and many times go, go unreported, and those that do, certainly display the fact that we failed and we made mistakes. We've done, we've made mistakes. The church, I think, as a family needs to admit, hey, we're weak. Because of our humanness, we're weak. And I can tell you with all, without <clears throat> any doubt that the same way, individually, that when we accept Christ, we accept Christ through grace, through faith in him. And it is that grace that moves on our hearts to say, yes, Jesus. It is that same grace that the church needs as well, collectively as a church body. Yeah. The church, I, I'm almost certain. I'm almost certain. Because I'm in the church. And I need that grace. And I'm almost certain that we have people that have been hurt by the church. Maybe not now, maybe some time ago. And this is the reason why I need to say publicly, I'm sorry. Because as a church leader, you shouldn't have been treated that way, regardless of whatever it was that may have hurt you. But we know this, that in our hearts of hearts, regardless of what the treatment was, that we must admit to ourselves that the same way Christ extends that grace and forgiveness, that we also should extend it toward each other. Oh, let me tell you. Yeah, we're a church of wounded healers, aren't we? Let me tell you, I'm wounded. Coming from a fragmented family of divorce, brokenness, 
that if it wasn't for the reality of the Savior who put me back together, okay, and began mending me, I probably wouldn't be in front of you right now. We're wounded, and we're all trying to heal. And is it possible, I don't know, is it, that God is bringing us back to a place like this because it is only in the context of the body where you find healing and recovery. Could it be? You ever wander away from the church body and then find yourself wanting to come back? Well, that's the case for many people because as I visit and I dialogue, many of them are starting to realize, yes, as we approach the, the, in the prophetic landscape, and timetable of this planet's history Paul makes it abundantly clear in the book of Hebrews he says do not forsake the gathering of the body especially he says he emphasizes especially as you see the end drawing nigh yeah the end is coming but here's my point my point is simply this you know that old colloquium expression don't cut your nose off to spite your face yeah you know, but the reality to the point is this. Don't, don't deny the solidarity, the unity. Don't deny the solidarity with Christ that can only be experienced within the confines of the church body, within the friendships, within the, the, the family structures, within the interpersonal relationships that are found in the Mosaic Christian Fellowship Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let me tell you. This is a wonderful place to be. I've only been here two, what, I'm going on three months now. And you guys have been wonderful, not just to me, but to my family. You've embraced me and have endeared yourself to my heart. Which is probably one of the reasons why it's made the transition for me somewhat a little bit more easier and for my family as well. But I can't speak for them at this moment. But it certainly has been making it a little bit more easier. But the point is this, we cannot mistake that even though we're called mosaic christian fellowship we can't mistake the word fellowship for membership sometimes we we can't mistake fellowship for membership in the body of christ oftentimes we think they're synonymous that's not the truth i don't i you know many times you hear you know i i don't want to confess being part of a body but i want to confess jesus christ you can't love the body but not hate the head or vice versa you can't and people tell me then what's the big deal what is the big deal about membership have you ever been asked that question what's the big deal about membership why does it even matter should it matter does it matter what's the big deal you know the, 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 there is no deeper solidarity and i want to emphasize this beat this horse until it's dead there is no deeper solidarity no more profound solidarity with christ than through his church family there isn't that's the point that is the entire point there is that unity that 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 embraces the heart and the soul of the person when they when they integrate themselves with a family that loves and cares for them. In fact, let me tell you, many times throughout scripture, in fact, if you look at the early church in the book of Acts, it's a good example. You remember that incident where Paul, the apostle, he wasn't the Paul and the apostle when he first started out. He was known as Saul, and he was of a city of Tarsus, and he was just gung-ho about eradicating a particular people group called the Way that were proclaiming the Messiah, the second coming, the resurrection, and then all of of a sudden he could not defeat the arguments of this small little group that was just emerging and then so he took it upon himself to do the unthinkable i'm gonna kill them i'm gonna destroy them i'm gonna persecute them and that's exactly what he did in fact he went so much as you look and read the storyline there in what is it um, acts chapter 9 he he talks about the experience when all of a sudden he sees this bright light and off the off the animal he's on the floor and he's looking at the bright light and then the words the words because those who were with him cannot could not see what he saw and the words that came to him words of solidarity 
Paul, Saul, I should say, why are you persecuting me? Do you catch it? And he's like, who are you, Lord? It is I, the one who you persecute, the Messiah. And he, in his mind, it's, it's just not registering. And then he, you know, what, you know what Jesus tells him because he's the Messiah. He tells him, get up and go to Straight Street and I'll tell you what you should do. Because he was asking, what do you want me to do, Lord? But do you notice the, 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 the language of solidarity? He not just identifies himself with the ones being persecuted, but he connects them with the church. He connects Paul with the church. It's the solidarity. He tells them, you're doing this to me. You're doing this to me. I mean, think about this. Think about it. The next time you encounter, you, you, you know, the, the propensity to want to let your humanness get the best of you, think about the fact that whatever you do to the church, whether it's good or whether it's bad, you're doing it to him. You're doing it to the Messiah. You're doing it to Christ. That's the point when Christ meets all. It's the identification, the solidarity, the power of Christ and his church. The power of two. Remember, we started out with the power of two, you and the Christ inside of you. The one who gives you the ability to stand up and proclaim the truth in the midst of a group of people that's opposing you. You got the courage now. You have the one with you, the power of two. But no, no, now it's the power of two, the power of Christ and his church, the, and his church, the body, the body. Oh. Do I need to be frank? Oh, no, bad pun. <laughs> bad pun. <laughs> I want to close with this. It doesn't seem logical that you can love the head and not the body. And so it doesn't work. It's illogical. It won't pay off. So what am I saying? I'm saying to those to integrate with the body, to become a committed, a committed and consistent member united in the body and here at the Mosaic Christian Fellowship Church to use your gifts, the ones that God has blessed you with, to use them in the context of ministry here to uplift the body as God intended it to do and to make Christ look good in this community. That's why I'm going to close with an appeal. I'm going, to give, I'm going to give three opportunities for you to respond to Christ. You may not fall into one, maybe two, but maybe the third. Or maybe you may fall into the first. But the first one, I want to invite all of you, or those who would like to stand up with me. You don't have to do it now. I want you to think about, maybe you haven't been part of a church family. Maybe Jesus is saying, I want you to be part of this church family. So that's the first appeal. Do you want to be part of our church family? If you're not, and if you would like to, I want to invite you to stand with me in just a moment. But if you're not, I want to invite you and challenge you to consider that. But for many of us who have been part of the Mosaic Christian Fellowship Church for many years, Maybe there is someone that you know that have kind of just slipped off the radar and just hasn't been attending. And you want to say to Jesus, do you want to pray for that person? Do you want to pray for that person and, and invite them to return, to pray for them, to reach out to that someone that you know and embrace them? Maybe that's something that Jesus is calling you for, putting that passion on your heart. What about the last one? Not just to join, that's the first one. The second one is to reach out to that person you may know. But what about the last one? The last one that, that says maybe Jesus is talking to you as you listen to my words for a renewed commitment, a renewed sense of commitment to serve and support your church family. And I'm talking about, you know, more than just, you know, bacon and eggs. But a renewed sense of commitment to be really willing to bring your gifts to bear. To support and to serve the church. To stand up for it. 
to speak for it, to really do it. Do you find yourselves responding to Jesus in any of those categories? Let's put up that last slide as we, we're going to call up in just a moment. Jesus is the one speaking, not me. If he's speaking to your heart this morning, to any of those categories, I want you to stand with me. But please don't do it because I'm asking. You do it because in, in your heart of hearts, that wholehearted dedication to commit to a cause will be far greater than the words I'm speaking. I want to invite you to stand if that's what you want. If you want to join the church, if you want to be part of the body, I want to invite you to that. If you want, if you're praying, you say, Jesus, please give me the courage to pick up that phone and call that one person. Or maybe the last one where you want a renewed sense to unite a sense of commitment to serve and support the church at all costs. Let's pray together. Father, we're standing. But only time will tell, Father, the level of that commitment. It needs to be grounded, Lord, not in my words. It needs to be grounded in a solid, in a solid commitment between not just knowing Jesus, but connecting with the body. We can't separate them and we're slicing and dicing, Father. Help us, Lord. Whatever commitment we've stood up for this morning, I pray that you will give us the courage to stand up to, for that third one. We say we're standing for that last one, to serve and, and, and to, to support. If that's the case, Father, and I pray for those who are standing in that vein, that you will give them the courage to do that. And if, it, if it's the second one, the person picking up the phone to reach out, to contact, then, Father, I pray that you give them the right words and that the person that they reach out to will be open and receptive, Father, to their words. And of course, Father, the first one, that they want to join the body of Christ. If there's anyone that really desires to do that, then I'll make myself available after this so that we can talk further. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us because it is through the collective, the, 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 unit, the united power through the gifts that we bring to bear in which this church, Father, will move forward in a united front to make you look good. Give us the courage, Lord, in the weeks, in the months, in the years ahead as we propose to, to put this to practice, Father, to do so under your might and strength. For we thank you, Lord Jesus, by asking all of this in the name of the one that we worship, our King and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.